and I have no idea how far we're going to make it this morning. So we're just going to read through the first 12 verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. In Christ Jesus our Lord, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for an amazing morning we get to come together in fellowship and in the ministry of the word to look at a short but such a powerful epistle and I pray God that your word by your spirit would be open to us that we would grow and walk by the gospel and we love you and pray in your name amen, amen. so what we have this is such a neat epistle this is Paul's last letter Paul, what we saw in the book of Acts, closing Acts, and we moved into um, Thessalonians and 1 Timothy, we know towards the end of the book of Acts, Paul was arrested. As he was wrapping up his um, ministry trip, he had gathered a love offering for the churches in Jerusalem. So he goes to the church in Jerusalem. He was asked to help participate in a function of ministry within the temple. Um, taking um, youth men through their ritual, if you will. And we, I would encourage you to look at the notes from Acts. But as he went in, he was talking about taking the gospel to Gentiles, and it created a riot. So they had to remove Paul and take him to the Antonio Fortress. But he convinced the Roman guards to let him address the crowd, and the Roman guards were probably hoping that he would not incite further the riot. We know that that did not happen. In fact, they got even more angry than they already were. They removed Paul. He was imprisoned for some time in Judea or Caesarea. And then he had appealed to Caesar. And essentially where we left Paul was his first imprisonment in Rome under house arrest. And that's where the story essentially leaves us. What we do know is that Paul, being released for a time, probably for a few years, and we don't know what the gap is between 1 and 2 Timothy, was rearrested and he was imprisoned in a different manner. So you'll notice as you go through the epistles, it makes some of his jail time seem weird. One epistle, he will be on house arrest, he can move about freely, he has guests, and everything seems you know, not great, but it could be worse. 2 Timothy brings us to worse. 2 Timothy is no longer under a house arrest, but rather his final stay is at Mamertine Prison in Rome. Um, I do not have the pictures, but I know somebody that does, and they are fantastic pictures. And he might show them to you if I get a nod of agreement. He's smiling, so I'm going to call it good. Wade has great pictures. And he's hiding in the back so he can't even run away from you. But basically, they, they will lower... Paul into um, what would really look like a big, like a cistern. They lower him just into this hole into the ground and everything that, you know, his food, whatever else, it is lowered into the ground with him. And there, and we also see it in 2 Timothy, he is awaiting execution. So this epistle is written somewhere in between about 65 and 67 AD, Paul being executed in 67 AD. And he was executed by Nero, who himself had died and by his own hand in 68 AD. So what makes the epistle so incredible and the blessing I, the blessing that Paul has is he knows that his execution is coming quickly. What do you do? If you knew you had two weeks, what would you do? Most of us would probably open up our bucket list, which I swear gets longer by the day, Oh, I have two weeks, and you look down, there's 50 things on this list. 
you're going to be doing everything you can to try and hammer out through the, I want to see this. I want to write this person. Like, oh, that person made me so mad when I was 12. 40 years later, I'm going to call him. I'm going to tell him so. What's so unique about this being the last letter is essentially three things. First, it's going to boil down for Paul in this letter, four chapters, what matters the most. And it's neat that even in the face of his execution, the second neat thing about the epistle is he is not concerned for himself. Not concerned for himself, but rather he's concerned for Timothy. And thirdly, he's concerned for the success of the gospel ministry. Those things are going to be his focus. And as we open up in chapter 1, we're going to see the first thing that Paul is essentially going to tackle in verses 3 through 12 is to encourage Timothy. So that's where we're going to jump in. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. That phrasing we are used to. We see it through a great deal of the Pauline epistles. Paul, this is so important for us, because this epistle, you remember in 1 Timothy, we talked about the minority, the minority of these false teachers or false apostles. In 2 Timothy, that minority very quickly becomes the majority. He's warning Timothy that as we move to the last times, you remember in 1 Timothy, he uses the word latter times. Completely different word in the Greek. Now as he's moving, he's talking about end times, where we get our fancy word for eschatology, study of last things. It's going to get worse. It's going to get harder. And we kind of see that. What happens when you say anything truth-related right now? People don't like it. They do not want to hear it. It's like, oh, people are just waging war against the church. Well, that is true. What we have noticed a lot of in the last several years is what we've called or deemed, coined, cancel culture. We don't like it, so it just needs to go away. And what's interesting is in the process of cancel culture, they'll send away something they don't like, and they're going to replace it with something worse, which they're also going to cancel. My favorite one right now is we need to get rid of the police. Police need, we need to defund the police. They can't be here, but you need to make sure you're supporting the FBI. What the world is doing doesn't really make any sense. So Paul, just like us, ooh, sorry, we're, we have new equipment. Some of you may not have seen the new spaceship terminal we have installed in the sound booth, so it's we're working on it here. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he knew exactly who he was what his calling is, and to whom he is called. And we'll hit that one quite a bit harder in verse 12. But then he adds something new. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. I love the phrasing. One, because it's kind of hard to break down between English, since we had this conversation last night, between English syntax and Greek syntax. I guess there's two ways to really look at it. According to... In the English verbiage, we understand according to. I want to play chess according to the rules of chess. What happens when you know the rules of chess, but the guy you're playing or gal does not know the rules of chess? What does that game look like? I remember that game. I taught my wife chess. I taught my kids chess. I love chess. The pieces move a certain way for a reason so you can have fulfillment through the game. If you take your knight from square one and move him all the way across the board and knock down one of my pieces, it doesn't make me chuckle. It makes me mad <laughs> because you're cheating. So we have kind of that aspect, him according to life. But we also have for, for the promise of life. Gives us a twofold thing. First, for Paul to be an apostle, and there's no according to the promise of life, his apostleship is useless. He'd be a false apostle, or it'd be a dead end. That's the difference between Jesus and everything else. Jesus is no longer in the grave. All the rest of the philosophers, they're still in there. <laughs> but Paul is going to hang on to this one. We've discussed so much over the last few weeks. Lost my train of thought. Your faith changes the dynamic the truth of your faith changes the dynamic of your hard situation 
if you're getting ready to be executed, let's say in a week, how much life do you have left? Everybody's going to tell you a week. But it's not that way with Paul. And he's relying so heavily on that promise because he knows exactly what's going to happen in the short time that he has left in that vessel. So this introduction really is quite unique to Second Timothy. It says, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So we have the cause and effect. God, because of his grace, now we have peace with God. And we discussed, and we'll turn back to our notes in First Timothy. Not First Timothy. Second Thessalonians, grace provides enablement for everything within the will of God, and peace gives serenity in every kind of circumstance. We understand grace and peace. We've been teaching both of those as we move through the Pauline epistles. But for the pastoral epistles, which is what Second Timothy is, it's a pastoral epistle. He's writing it to Timothy, who is currently pastoring at Ephesus. We're going to see in this epistle that Paul is sending Tychicus to replace, loves that name, Tychicus to replace Timothy, so Timothy can come and visit him in Rome. So it's a pastoral epistle and a prison epistle. He adds mercy. Paul adds mercy to the pastoral epistles. And Spurgeon actually has something pretty neat to say about this passage. So this is Spurgeon. Did you ever notice... This one thing about Christian ministers, that they need even more mercy than other people. Although everybody needs mercy, ministers need it more than anybody else, and so we do. For if we are not faithful, we shall be greater sinners even than our hearers. And it needs much grace for us always to be faithful, and much mercy will be required to cover our shortcomings. So I shall take those three things to myself, grace, mercy, and peace. You may have the two, grace and peace, but I need mercy more than any of you. So I take it from my Lord's loving hand, and I will trust and not be afraid, despite all my shortcomings and feebleness and blunders and mistakes in the course of my whole ministry. And remember, for our context's sake, what Paul is doing is trying to strengthen Timothy, trying to encourage Timothy for the things that are coming. And as always, it's important for us to know, and I have it, all the time highlighted in my Bible that word from that's the source we typically have grace and peace we typically try and draw it from anywhere else really when you ask what gives you peace sometimes it's substance sometimes it's situation I'm going to drink a little bit or I'm going to watch a little bit how often is our peace from television or just something to distract us and keep us busy lately it's what's being put out by wsl anybody familiar with it surfing championships are going on right now (laughs) but we always try and draw those from something else normally as a distractor but you notice as soon as you stop drinking or you turn off your television where is that heaviness it is right back in your heart Mercy is the interesting one. We typically seek mercy from whom? People. And then what happens when you don't receive that mercy? Now it feels like everybody's trying to eat you. We try and draw all of these things from the wrong source. And it's going to continue to cause rot in the life of the Christian. So verse 3, this is where we move, verse 3 through 12. We move into Paul trying to encourage and strengthen Timothy. Why? As you've seen us going through, especially 1 Timothy, Timothy was having a lot of people within the church. Timothy was young. Church historians like to think that Timothy was somewhere around 30 to 35 years old when he started pastoring a church. But when we use the word pastoring, we think, oh, there's Pastor Wage. He has this church. And in Ontario, we have Pastor Paul. He has that church. We have one in Meridian. We have, I think, two in Boise. There's one in Eagle. There's churches all everywhere. But each church has its own pastor and its own board and its own bishops and whatever else. Not quite the case in the first century church. You have to remember, those churches met in homes. One pastor or a bishop, episcopos, one pastor would mostly be controlling, like, technically eight or nine different churches, eight or nine different households. Let's talk about chess. Let's not talk about chess. Let's talk about cornhole. 
How many people play cornhole? How many people have house rules? Sure. Yeah. Or what's another good? Uh, pinochle. People have house rules. Spades. I learned spades in the Marine Corps. Come to find out, that's not really spades. That's prison spades. There's, there's like, uh, who's ever heard of any, any spade players in here? Who's familiar with Little Willie Walks? Yeah, Big King, Little King. Or Big Joker, Little Joker. Um, who's kicking, who's driving? All this stuff, that's, that's, those are prison rules. So when you go to play these games with like regular people or people with their own house rules, like, oh, you can't do that. I was like, what are you talking about? It's Little Willie Walks. Perfectly legal. I looked up the rules for spades. So not legal. We play cornhole like we play horseshoes. What happens if you go over 21? You go back to 11. Not everybody plays that way. Same thing, house rules in the church. Timothy, who's, we're just going to go with 30. That is fiercely young to be a pastor. My age is young to be a pastor. Somewhere in my 30s. So when you have people that are older with experience, or you have people that are just forward, just blunt. Whether they're trying to be rude or not, they're just going to be like, you know what? This is the way things are. And sometimes it just seems easier to not deal with that person, to avoid the confrontation altogether and just commit it to the Lord, commit it to the Spirit. Now, certainly there is application for that one, but it can make discipline within the body hard. And at some point, and we've been there, we just, you know what, I don't want to deal with it anymore. It's too much. I'm done letting a fire burn bright. I'm just going to let it kind of dwindle down a little bit until it's in a place I can just extinguish it. Or if it's just a little fire, some of us camp and it's not the right answer, but someone's like, well, if I just let it burn down to embers, it'll be fine till morning. So Paul is writing to strengthen his son in the Lord. So verse 3, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. Without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day. Love it. Paul was a prayer warrior. And I love the beginning of verse 3. I thank God. All morning, in all transparency, not just all morning, but all night. Huge complainer. I've been complaining about everything. Is the camera working? Is the camera working now? No, our camera's still not working. But it was yesterday. The soundboard is sorcery. Um, Ken, thank you by the way for installing it for us. Like, you know, just put your hands on it. Just touch a button. It's going to be fine. You can't break anything that I can't fix. Challenge accepted. I didn't break it. But I pushed a button, and all these other knobs, physical knobs, started moving by themselves. And it's like, this is, who's supposed to run this? Okay, I have I have Matt, and we have a, a few other people in the church that are like, oh, that's not so bad. Last night, um, while we were here working, I looked at Cassie, and I was like, didn't these people tell you that this thing was user-friendly? I was like, oh, it absolutely is, but you have to define user. <laughs> it's been really hard for me in the last two days, despite all of the blessings, how one little thing really throws you off track. Because we don't need soundboard. We don't need speakers. We don't need a keyboard. We don't need any of the stuff in here. What we need is Jesus. And it's apparent that we have a whole lot of Jesus. And yet I still find something to grumble about. Paul is sitting in the Mamertine prison. I would encourage you. There's also videos on YouTube that show guys trying to do a little tour through there. It's not like a happy place. It's not the best Western. It is a horrible place to spend the rest of your time. And yet Paul still has something um, thankful for. And he's thanking him for Timothy, but he also says, whom I serve with a pure conscience. First, we need to look at the word serve. Love that word. We have to notice that that word is not in the past tense. You catch that? There's no D on it. He's stuck in prison. Where can he go? Nowhere. It's a hole in the ground. I don't know how high that hole is from the ground, 10 feet. Paul, historically, was a short dude. He's not Michael Jordan that up through the hole to get out of jail. And yet his service is not past tense. The situations that we are stuck in, which is probably not nearly as bad as Paul's situation, he still uses the present tense word serve. He is currently serving the Lord 
in jail, writing his epistles, strengthening the church, and prayer. We underrate prayer way too much for a church. I'm not talking about this fellowship, but just in general. We underrate prayer. Well, how often did Paul pray? He sums it up pretty good. <laughs> Night and day. Just pray. I would encourage us also to look at the ministry of John, the beloved disciple. Because of his witness, because of his testimony, because he just wouldn't die, he was sent to the island of Patmos. Patmos was a very rocky penal colony for political prisoners. He was stuck out there turning big rocks into small rocks and small rocks into sand. That was his, that was his thing. And yet being stuck out there, still serving the Lord, he was just in the throne room of God as he wrote the book of Revelation. So he thanks God, whom he serves with a pure conscience as his forefathers did. How many of us have issues with that verse? How many of us have been joining on Friday nights as we're moving through the book of Exodus? We'll continue through Exodus and Numbers. A lot of grumblers, a lot of complainers, a lot of lack of faith or doubt or issues or fighting or theft or idolatry in the list is... 36 books long. What Paul is discussing is him learning and being prepared for his faith in Christ by the rabbis. And he is praying for Timothy night and day, and he greatly desires him. Verse 4, that's what I really love about the church. What is it that you greatly desire? Nothing hurts my heart more than an absence of fellowship, which is really hard for me. Because I'm not typically a, for lack of, for, to quote my mother, I'm not a fellowshipy person generally. But I notice what happens to my mind and my heart when I'm absent from the fellowship. The more time you spend apart from the body of Christ, the more apt you are to listen to your distractions or just the wrong heart from people. Paul, in his harsh circumstance, how much, I'm sure some of us have been there. How many of us have had just a really long day or a really rough morning? It's like, man, I could really use a cup of coffee right now. Man, I could really use a beer right now. Man, I could really use fellowship right now. And there is a whole horde of you in the room right now that should be tethered to somebody else. Who can I call when I'm having these problems? Kyle loves to answer those kind of phone calls. Who can I call when the, the soundboard isn't working? From now on, we're, we're going to call, call Ken. Ken. <laughs> he desires fellowship. And being mindful of your tears, I may be filled with joy. The thing that's going to fill Paul with joy is seeing Timothy. And Paul is mindful of Timothy's tears. What does that mean? Paul, who picked up Timothy, remember Timothy, we talked about it um, in Acts chapter 16, where when Timothy really starts to join Paul and his missionary journey. Timothy probably heard Paul on his, fifth, uh, his first missionary journey as Paul traveled through Lystra and Derby. Remember that passage. Paul and Barnabas came into town, and they thought that they were Hermes and some other Greek who is, you know, we have so many names. Two Greek gods. One of them definitely Hermes because one was speaking more. So they tried to offer a bull for Paul and Barnabas, and they freaked out, tore the clothes, like, stop, we're just people. Stop doing, doing weird stuff, and what do they do? They drug him out of town, and someone even left him here and thought he was dead. Timothy probably saw Paul at the height of his whoopings. Paul's second missionary journey through the same similar region, Timothy joins Paul. Timothy is used to being around Paul, probably joined Paul somewhere in his late teens, early 20s. It is also very possible that Timothy was present as Paul was being drugged off. So Paul is remembering those tears. So he's greatly desiring to see him. And he is filled with joy. Verse 5. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. I don't know that I could give a stronger verb to encourage a believer. When the world or people, especially people, when people are attacking you, especially people that know you, they have intimate details of your life. That's why family is one of the hardest to witness to. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. You need Jesus. Ten years ago, I saw you push your kid out of his uh, wheelchair. Like, and they're going to bring up all the bad stuff from your past. 
when they're trying to levy it against you. Or when it seems like the world is just on fire all around you, the first thing you're going to question is your faith. The second thing you're going to question is your calling, especially if someone that serves in the ministry. You're going to want to quit. I have been there once a bunch of times. You no longer are going to feel like your faith is genuine. And that word for faith is the same we've been working through, which is pistis. It's not just a word for truth, but more of a conviction of the truth. Something that causes you to live differently. You're going to question those things. Timothy is being bombarded by, for what we develop in context, men that think they're entitled to be in a position of leadership simply because they're men, pushy women, he has stomach issues, um, and he's being hailed or challenged because he's a heretic. And now his teacher, who like that verbiage or that old adage, the apple never falls far from the tree, his teacher just got whooped and has been arrested again and is ready for execution by the Romans. So you can just imagine all the bombarding things. So Paul, the first thing he throws out there is that he is filled with joy when he remembers the genuine faith. That word genuine literally means unhypocritical, which means it is not an act. Jesus isn't just the addition to his life, but Jesus is his life. Which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am and I am persuaded is in you also. Love the relationship piece. This faith was in your grandmother. This faith was in your mother, and I am certain that it is in you. So we have a couple different aspects. First, that faith is in their home, and I love the demonstrations of God saving family. We see this thing being passed through the women in the family. We know that his mother was Jewish, but his father was Greek. So he wasn't really raised in the Orthodox Greek setting, but yet he was still being prepared from youth to pursue Jesus. The ministry of the home is something we can never, ever afford to underrate. We should have that ministry in the home. And as far as the relationship piece, Timothy is not going to be saved by his parents' faith. We do know in 1 Corinthians that the child is sanctified by the faith of the believing parents. But that doesn't last forever. We have to understand that as parents. We have to understand that as grandparents. At some point, a child will come to the age of accountability. And everybody has their opinions on that one. What is the age of accountability? What is that age where I can no longer save my son? Most people say it's 13, but you know why. Because when Jewish boys become men, it was 13 years old. For us 13, I was a dirtbag. I needed Jesus for us 13. My mother did everything she could to make sure that I was learning Jesus' name. That age of accountability is going to be different for everyone. My daughter was baptized somewhere around seven, six. You don't remember. Somewhere around six or seven, one of us is right, one of us is wrong, she came to the faith really pretty early. Now, we do not believe, Calvary Chapel distinctly, we do not baptize children. When a toddler and infant is born, we don't just take them and go baptize them right away because then it's just an act, just a show. It's a choice. When my kids can fully tell me what baptism is, what it represents, and what it's for, and they can consciously make that choice for Christ, they are baptized. Sai is not baptized yet. We are still teaching the word in our home. We're still trying to raise up our kids in the home. We have complications. We have hardships just like the rest of you. And I pray very fiercely that he gets there eventually, but they can't ride the coattail of somebody else's salvation. One of my favorite examples is the Egyptians in the book of Exodus. It's a really stupid thing for the Egyptians to have gone across the Red Sea. Nobody in their right mind would do that. How many of us have done something really, really stupid because we saw somebody else do it first? Most of you. And most of the men are laughing harder than the women. Shocker. They saw the Israelites go through, so they thought they were going to be safe doing the exact same thing that the Israelites were doing. There was a difference. God was with the Israelites, not with the Egyptians. So they were washed under. Therefore, So as he is strengthening him, he's going to continue to put this faith that he knows is in Timothy, the truth that he knows is in Timothy, he's going to put it towards more of an application piece. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God. Love it. 
everybody needs a reminder to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So first he gives a reminder to stir up. That word in the Greek is fantastic. It means a fan into full flame. This is Baker City. We get this one. How many people, when we go camping, we've got our stick. Everybody's got their stick, and that's the stick they use for the fire. And we get super upset when somebody messes with our stick. It could be one we just found in the woods, but it's been our best friend for 20 years. We have our stick, and we know exactly you get those, you get that guy. There could be 50 coals in the fire, but he knows exactly which one to roll over, and that fire is just uh, cooking. While the rest of us takes us 40 minutes just to figure out how to light the thing to begin with. There's a couple of aspects to this one. The first one is some commentators do feel that if you do not use your gifts that the Spirit has given you in ministry and service to the Lord for the edification of the church or for the spreading of the gospel, that those gifts will dwindle out and dissipate. So you need to use that gift. You need to get in there and stir up and keep it in full flame. Is that what we're talking about? I'm not sure. It's a pretty good descriptor. I think largely what we're talking about is if we don't want attention, we're not going to do things to draw attention to ourselves. How many of us are married to a loud spouse? Do not raise your hand. <laughs> we don't like, like for myself, I'm not married to a loud spouse. I don't like negative, I don't like any kind of real attention in public. I've seen husbands and wives one of them is married to one of the loud ones and they cause this huge scene in the store but the only time I choose to really like just go from zero to six and start beating my children is if they're making a scene in like a supermarket it doesn't matter what aisle you're on in Walmart everybody knows exactly where you are because there's like a beacon in the middle of the store I'm going to extinguish that beacon as fast as humanly possible period Everybody says it. Oh, that kid's having a bad day. Poor, poor mother. And you see the, the mom dragging the kid through the store. It's like, oh, my goodness. Like, I'm glad. So glad I'm not that parent. Six years later, I'm that parent three times. <laughs> One of my favorite examples, we went to Africa a number of years ago. It was part of the Jesus Film Ministry. And we take with us a generator and all the stuff that we need for an outdoor movie theater. We show a couple of, of photos of that one. And we cart this thing through the jungle wherever we're going in Africa, we turn it on. We play movies like the Jesus film or Magdalena, films that we can get in their tongue. So English, our tongue, which is in Liberia, or Basa, Pele, some of their local languages. If they're used to not really having power or those kind of lights in a village of, say, 200 people, do you know what happens when you fire up an outdoor movie theater in the middle of the jungle where there is no lights? That little village turns into 2,000 people really fast. And it completely caught me off guard. I'm staring at the screen, and your eyes focus to the light. But you turn around, you start to see these little fires everywhere. There's people sitting under vehicles, on vehicles, in vehicles, in the huts, on top of the hut, just kit everywhere. But if you are Timothy, who's being bombarded by the enemy, by people being used by the enemy, because you are spreading the gospel, you are going to be tempted to let the flame die down. There's just enough to cook a hot dog or keep your toes warm, but not enough to attract any insects or fire trucks or police or anybody else wanting to wander your campfire. So he's going to let it die out just a little bit. He's saying don't. And we'll tether that back into verse 8 once we get to it. So it is a living flame, and he should not be discouraged or essentially let it turn into routine. We as believers let our faith turn into something routine, and that will also kind of kill out our fire. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Very encouraging passage. First off, he has not given us a spirit of fear. That fear that is being levied against you right now by something or, more often, someone, that's not God. That's not from God. When you recognize right out the gate that that's from the enemy, now you know how you should be responding and fighting against that particular enemy. So instead of that spirit of fear, rather power and of love. I love the word power. We really like to think it's something that gives us authority 
over somebody to make somebody or to coerce or to manipulate somebody to do something else. One, I like the concept that power yeah. is subdued, which we'll get to, but also how many of us often feel like your batteries are just running low? Turn off your television and your phones. Go back into prayer and into your Bible. How much power does God have to display through the believer? Because of my limited vocabulary, I'm going to go with a lot. <laughs> what is that power for? I'm going to make someone do something for me. No. What's the next one? Love. Love the aspect and the application of power. Love. Not just for God. Not just for the believer, but for the unbeliever also. That's why Christians are game changers. Because you're not normal. When someone pokes you in the eye, what do you want to do? You don't just want to poke them in the eye. You want to run them over with your car. That's a fleshly response, but not the response from the believer. To love your enemies and to pray for those that persecute you. That's not normal. And the power of God allows us to be able to do that not normal thing. And of a sound mind, more literally self-control, not acting rashly. Therefore, love that word therefore, was it therefore, all of these things under the power of God, it's not normal. What do we do when we have something in front of us that we don't understand? I think I told, it might have been Cassie, could have been Ken or Kyle. If I don't understand that soundboard, it's going in the trash. Things that we don't understand, we get afraid of, and we respond with a an emotional response, and it's typically not a good one. A funny one, but not a good one, not a healthy one. It's, a bit obvious, it's often a destructive response because it's rash, and we haven't thought through it. But because of the Spirit of God, we have one well, of the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. It allows us to be in a place of not acting rash. It says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me, his prisoner. Guzik points out that the cross and the Christ and the crucifixion has been sanitized, that it has been cleansed. That is true. When we think of Jesus, we don't think it as a shameful thing. We've had 2,000 years of Jesus since his earthly ministry. What's hard is we're separated by a 2,000-year gap a 2,000-year cultural gap. So let's talk about the Jews. The Jews have Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. We fast forward that into the Gospels, into Galatians, into Colossians. We know that Jesus bore our curse and the punishment for that curse on the cross. But for the Jews, like you're following a guy who called himself God, so now he's a blasphemer, and he was hung on a tree. He's cursed. He, was, he had hands laid on him by the Gentiles. So he's unclean, he's cursed, and he's a blasphemer. That is going to be your Messiah. So they're kind of cut off from the Jews. The Greeks, how did the Greeks see Jesus? They'd have seen Jesus as a slave. He was put on the cross as a conquered slave. He had zero education zero wealth because he didn't have that level of education that they did. You remember Paul and Timothy are battling the Gnostics that uh, knowledge essentially is power above anything else. He didn't have any of those things. Why would you follow him instead of someone like Galileo or I don't know, somebody else that's smart and had weird drawings? To the Romans, why would the Romans follow Jesus? He was a Jewish carpenter of a conquered people. And he was crucified. Something to the Romans was reserved for the worst political prisoners. By law, you couldn't crucify a Roman citizen. That's how low they looked at the concept of the crucifixion. So he'd be ashamed. Why? Christianity brings suffering. Can render you in the carnal aspect, not carnal, secular aspect of being poor. You'll be persecuted. Christians are called servants, and again, he was crucified. So that's Jesus. And now you have Paul. Paul was not 
like the Jewish Fabio. Like everybody that talks about Paul talks about how short he was and his weird nose and everything else. And while he was highly educated, he was a Pharisee. He was a tent maker. The more literal of his job is a tent repair guy. That was the job of a slave. Which is why he had so many issues in Corinth. And now he's in chains. What happens when we do have that loud spouse? Or that person, that friend of ours that's arrested or does something really, really stupid? I don't know that guy. I'm not with him. We disassociate pretty quick. Paul is saying, don't disassociate because of these things. Like These things were testified to from the very beginning. That part makes sense. Here's the crazy part. But share with me in the sufferings. That's not the invitation I want. I want to be invited to a barbecue or a pool party or to go to Israel if you're paying for the flights. I want to be invited to fun stuff. Nerf gun war. How much fun was that? That's the stuff I want to be invited to, to shoot kids with Nerf guns. It was a blast. But to be invited into the sufferings, when we decide to follow Christ, he says, pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. That is an invitation to suffering. And here's kind of another little spin on the aspect of suffering. For the gospel according to the power of God. How many people are confused by that verse? Suffering according to the power of God. That's a complicated one, isn't it? When and how often is the power of God present? The answer is always. I think it was Warren Wiersbe that said the power is always there to remove an obstacle. That's true. There certainly is truth to Wiersbe's statement. Is there a power of God to remove an obstacle? That's what we want. If there's something hard we're getting ready to do, we will pray fiercely that that thing is moved. If there's someone in our life that keeps poking us in our eye, what do we do? We get one of those prayers of David, Lord, crush that individual. Just crush him. Strike him down. We pray. Then we keep reading our Bibles. You have to pray believing. Oh, God's going to strike him down any moment. That backstabber, uh, gossiper. So as soon as he leaves the church, what do we do? We wait behind the window because we know, because we prayed believing that God's going to strike him down as soon as he gets to his car. We don't want to be too close. What happens when God doesn't strike him down? Does that mean that the power of God is absent? Does that mean that you don't have faith to call down lightning and strike down Bob or whoever it is that's making you angry? Bob is not making me angry. What happens? We're praying to get out of that hard situation. We try and pray, believe, and we go into that hard situation anyway. That causes us to kind of doubt our faith. Well, I didn't pray hard enough to strike down Bob. Maybe God's just going to do it later. And it rattles us up a little bit. But we have to remember that often, I would wager more often, that the power of God is not demonstrated by the removal of an obstacle, but rather how he carries us through it. I would wager that the power of God is demonstrated more by how he carries us through trial. My favorite example brings me back to my favorite book. I say it a lot, but I'm pretty sure this is my favorite. This is the book of Daniel, chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not going to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. So Nebuchadnezzar, because he knows Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because Nebuchadnezzar loves Daniel. Daniel's someplace else in the whole empire of Mesopotamia. So he gives him a chance. We're going to do this thing again. Which, when you read the list of all the people that were present, to re that whole situation would have been intense. We're going to do this whole thing again, just for you three, because maybe you just didn't get it. You're going to bow down when you hear all the little music. You're going to bow down, you're going to worship my big dumb gold statue. They say, no, we're not doing that. I wonder whether or not they actually let him re it first before they said, nah, we're good. They say, we will not bow down, but we are going to demonstrate the power of God. He is going to stop the situation. But we see their demonstration of faith. Even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't do what I think he should do, we're going to worship him anyway, not your big dumb 90-foot gold statue. So Nebuchadnezzar, super angry, stokes up the fire. He took verse 7 like or verse 6 like way into out of context. He stoked up that fire real hot to even the people that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. They died. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the furnace, and they stayed in the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar, very pleased with himself, starts looking into the furnace. It shouldn't have been. How are they still alive? It's, hey, didn't he just throw three people in there? Look, there's a fourth one that looks like the Son of God. That's a demonstration of God's power, how he carries them through. They weren't hurt. Their hair wasn't singed. They didn't even smell like smoke. That is not the part of the passage that fascinates me the most. If you're going to throw me into something that I don't like, ice water. How many people have done like a Tough Mudder? You have to do the ice bath. That's terrible. I got in, I came up, and I couldn't see. Like my vision was blinded. I got, I didn't even go straight and wide like you're supposed to. I was the guy that you don't want to play chess with that moves this horse way over here. I went out on the side. You want out of that situation as soon as possible. When we're in a hard situation, we want it to end. We want it to be done. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego didn't leave the furnace. Like the worst possible situation you could fathom is being stuck in an oven. That doesn't even sound, they wouldn't leave. They stayed in there. Why? Because God was in there with them. That is a demonstration of God's power as well. If God is not delivering you right now through your hardship, it could be that he's going to demonstrate his power by carrying you through it. And he warns the same thing to his friend, not to avoid shame, not to avoid disgrace, not to avoid trial, hardship, because people look at it funky. If you are a Christian, you should just be prepared to be looked at like you're a weirdo. Odds are you're weird before that. Verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Why is it that Paul can be so zealous and courageous? Because he knows that he is saved. And he knows that he has been called or he has been chosen. He's like, oh, what do I know about my calling? I'm trying to follow Jesus. What do I know about my calling? First thing about our calling, it is a holy calling. Derivative of the word hagios. We like to use that word as saint. Saint Wage, Saint Paul, Saint Josh, Saint Cassie, Saint whatever. We're called to be separated. We're called to be consecrated. Not doing the things of the world, but doing the things that please God. So, with a holy calling, not according to our own works. Awesome. That is the first truth that you have to know about your calling. Is it's not based on your works. Not even a little bit. Every single person, Isaiah, I think, sums it up pretty well. Our good works, our righteousness is like filthy rags. You're a dirtbag. Every single person in here has something weird. You have something that is hurt. You have something that is sinned. You have somewhere you have fallen or faltered or tripped. Your salvation has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Jesus. My friends, I would also challenge you to leave it there. We come to this knowledge that we're not saved by our works. So once we're saved, then what do we start doing? Well, I have to maintain my salvation with works. Otherwise, God's not going to like me anymore. It has nothing to do with your works, which is why grace and mercy are so important as vocabulary words in the life of the believer. And he carries on with, but according to his own purpose and grace, saved for God's purpose, not for your purpose. And we'll discuss those here in a sec. Which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Before you ever had the opportunity to sin. You were saved by his grace. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, brought life and immortality through or brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The Christ had revealed the purpose and the grace of God. He has brought light to that. So you notice you read through the Old Testament, anywhere from Genesis through Malachi, especially through Kings, and in Genesis it says, Well, he was gathered to his fathers. He was gathered to his people. It doesn't really matter, good or bad. And we've seen, you know, good kings, good people, bad kings, bad people, all the way through the Old Testament. Where did they go when they died? It's the same word for all of it. They went to Sheol or the depths. In the book of Luke, Jesus gives us a little more of a descriptor. He says, Well, this is Abraham's bosom. So when they go to Sheol or Hades, 
we saw the rich man go to one place, which he did not care for very much, and we saw Lazarus go into Abraham's bosom. So Jesus starts to break it down. He also breaks down what happens. We have all of this light, all of this insight into death and what happens after death. For example, sleep. I love the way they talk about the death of a believer. He's not dead, he's just sleeping. That's very comforting. To know that you're going to wake up essentially in glory at the feet of Jesus in a body hopefully with a full head of hair. So we have quite a bit more insight. He abolished death. Death now being called sleep. Death has no sting. What stops us from doing things stupid? Consequences. Repercussions. We got to learn those as we get older. You know, as kids, they most kids don't fear death. So they'll do essentially whatever they want. How many kids had a child that tried to stick like a fork or whatever into the receptacle? We know better, or we should. Don't do it if you don't know better. It can bring death or lifelong repercussions. What stops us as adults from doing something really dumb? A fear of death. A fear of the things that are to be left behind. A fear of things that are unfinished. But for the believer, what Paul is trying to instill is like, I am quite literally facing execution from Nero, the worst guy so far in a long line of just bad leadership. But there's no reason to fear death because death to the believer, quite honestly, means nothing. No, I'm not saying you should go base jumping without a parachute. What I am saying is you should be able to spread the gospel without fear, which is what he's trying to encourage Timothy to. To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. One who heralds the truth, one who takes the truth out, and one who makes the truth known to somebody else. All for the purpose of making the gospel known. These are four, or I'm sorry, three great offices. It's great to be a preacher, a herald of the gospel, someone we can imagine like Billy Graham or Greg Laurie, someone who is an apostle or a, an ordained, identified spreader of the gospel, what we have now essentially as missionaries, or a teacher or the pastor-teacher situation. All of those things is for the furtherance of the gospel and to make God known. Paul knows exactly why he's in the position that he is in. For this reason, I also suffer these things. That's important. Do you know why you suffer? If you are suffering because you're teaching the gospel or you're spreading the gospel, you're trying to make the gospel known, you're trying to just win souls for the Lord, if you're suffering for that thing, while it's hard, you should do it with a smile on your face because you've invited into the sufferings a partaker of those sufferings, as Paul tells us in Philippians. If you are suffering because you're a dope and you did something stupid, don't wave it under the banner of Christianity. If you're dumb, you're going to be harassed because you're an idiot. But it's important to know where you stand. Not on the dumb thing, but in Jesus. If you are suffering for it, that should bring truth to your ministry. That should bring a steadfastness to your ministry. Because the devil, the world, is not going to want to hear those things. So it really should be something to encourage. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Love it from Paul. No regrets. He's been beat up, stoned, left for dead, arrested, they tried to assassinate him. You remember that group that took an oath when they took Paul into the Antonio Fortress? It's like, we're not going to eat anymore until we kill Paul. I doubt they stuck to their uh, convictions. So Paul says he has no regrets. Why was Paul able to be so bold? Because of what he knew. He says, for I know whom I have believed. So there's the first thing. He knows exactly who he believes in. And that gives us the concept of the personal relationship, a daily relationship with Christ. He knows exactly who he believes, and he is also persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. A lot of people really fight over that. What did Paul commit to God? Short answer, everything. His ministry, his hurt, his suffering, his pain, his life. Paul knows his life being committed to God, though he faces imminent execution, that's not the end of Paul. 
Paul is persuaded there. If we have that kind of faith, honestly, what is stopping the church from serving, from spreading the message? Well, they're not going to like me anymore. How does that hurt you? Be realistic. They probably didn't like you to begin with. You're not called to be successful in the spreading of the message. How many people fumble over their words? I do it every week. Success isn't your thing to focus on. Faithfulness, obedience is our thing to, to focus on. Spread the message. If they don't accept it, that's not on you. If they do accept the message, now it's on you. Because now we move into a place of discipleship and raising them up in the Lord. But we can't let fear of what the world or people think. Because if they had their way, this message would have been extinguished 2,000 years ago. And here we are going strong. So like Timothy, I pray that we would be encouraged. Despite what the world or people are trying to throw. And that we would move forward in obedience and the furtherance of the gospel and the edification of the body of Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for an amazing morning. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the, the ability, because of your spirit, that despite the, just the hard things or the heaviness of the situation or just what seems to be an, also, an impossible situation, Lord, we can still function outside of that sphere. In a world that would teach us we should have our thumb on top of people or that love is weakness, and the mercy is worse than that. Lord, it's your power demonstrated that these things are absolutely important because it's your love and your mercy and your grace, God, that has pulled us from condemnation. I pray, God, that we would be strengthened to share your message with the one that we've been hesitant to do so. Knowing, Lord, that it's our calling. So we love you and we praise you and we pray.